is 10 that, 15 central is is my voice way too loud okay all right uh that's andrea she's from equinox um i'm ruth i'm from indiana and do a variety of things that's us that's our uh Alignment. Oral graphing or something. I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, we probably should have had presenters crossed out and then entertainers. Uh, you, okay. It's, it's suspect. You may not be entertained. So we know in the program, it does say 3.9 and 3.10, but we talked about 3.9 last summer and we don't want to do it again. You can see the video there. On the internet. On forever. the internet. Just like go search one. the internet. <laughs> or put in that exact uh, URL, the slides will be available. I'm looking at the slides, reading them like that. All right. Hello to all the Zoom people. Hi, Zoom people. And Andrea is going to tell us what we're going to do, but I just need to point out, is Jason in here? Okay. Well, Jason is the director for the Worcester, Worcester oh, oh, Public Library, and that's his husband. He might have served you a drink last night at the reception, but he's also a gift because he was on Nailed It on Netflix in the seasonal thing. And he put a post-it on a Rice Krispie treat and called it innovation. And so if that feels relatable. That's what we're here to talk that's about. That's what we're today, here to talk about. Innovation. That's right. That's right. We attributed that to, there's a, there's a image credits at the end. Yeah. Okay. Definitions. Yeah. No, I mean, I'll just, I'll just stand here. It couldn't be the Ruth show. No. And I'll just stand here and smile. This is weird. We can't be <laughs> close to each other because we'll feedback. That's true. That's true. That's, that's true without microphones as well. Um, so these are some definitions. I know that um, a lot of you probably know these terms, but some feedback, actual responsive feedback, not audio feedback that we've gotten in earlier years um, was that sometimes we used uh, jargons. So because we are librarians, uh, both of us, here is here are your terms. These are things that we might you might hear us use. So if you uh, don't know what we're talking about, that is that is what we're talking about. So. And I'd also encourage you if there is some jargon that is not up here, yeah, if yeah. you hear us say, write it down and tell us. Yeah. Um, we'll try to make it a little less less text heavy next year, or we'll two page it. Right. And uh, or make a sign for your library. And we might or might not have time uh, for questions at the end, depending on how much digression uh, we have. But, you know, we will do our best to have questions. And if you have questions that we don't get to. Wait, how much um, time do we have? What? How much time do we have? Uh, 42 oh, minutes. OK, let's <laughs> so, this has been released. It happened in uh, November of 2022. Some of, is anybody on 310 yet? It's bleeding edge. Okay, I'm not going to ask you for feedback. Um, we're just moving hey, on. Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, oh, this is my name on it. I'm looking. Yeah, I'm yeah, looking. going to talk about angular circulation because I love it, but I have not tested any of it. So. Okay, so this is an experimental interface that was released in 310, um, and this is taking the old circulation interfaces or the current circulation interfaces, which are in Angular JS, and moving them to the new version, which is Angular. Um, and it is, if you enable a new library setting um, and have correct permissions to do so, um, you can see this whole new circulation uh, menu that says circulation experimental. And those are the things that are currently available on that, um, in that new Angular circulation. So because this is still experimental, testing um, and reporting, bug reporting on this is definitely encouraged. Um, and it's still, uh, nobody's gonna be forced to move to this yet, but it's out there in 310 if you have 310 or a 310 test system ideally um, and wanna play around with this, that's available. And um, it looks a lot like regular circulation except Angular. So next, and I will show you. And it will also be, if you're skipping 310 and going 39, to 311, it will be experimental in a 311 yes, as well. That is a very good point. It is still experimental in 311. Um, this is an example from a test system of what uh, the uh, patron checkout screen looks like. I will uh, note for our uh, OGs in the audience that the colored box around the name from the beloved Zool days has returned. Yes. So yeah, yeah. Um, and this is a, a screenshot of the uh, I can't item. You said beloved Zool days. I, did, I, we got cheers. I know, but Stephanie's sitting so close. 
I'm sorry, Stephanie. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is another screenshot from Angular Circulation. This is uh, the check-in um, grid. And then um, another good thing with Angular Circulation, and in fact, with all our, uh, almost all of the newer Angular interfaces, is this cool feature called grid menu configuration. So this is, yes, that's another woohoo that is deserved because what this does is it lets you take menus that are particularly long um, and just in select what you're seeing. So if you don't need to use all of these actions, you can uncheck it and it saves it as a workstation setting and you don't have to see the actions that you don't need to see in this and several other Angular grids. I know the uh, holdings uh, grid in cataloging is another one. So mm -hmm. uh, that is a thing for, for most new Angular interfaces. So if you have new Angular interfaces, look for this grid config thing and you know hide those actions that you don't need because some of them are quite long. Okay, I want to I go back. This. I want to go back to this real oh. quick. That was sneak preview of build a cat. But um, I will point out too. I was thinking immediately that item status would be part of this package. It is not. Uh, not yet. Yeah, not yet. But when it is, there will be celebratory cupcakes that you have to provide yourself um, <laughs> because distribution is hard. Okay, Angular acquisitions. Ac <laughs> This is kind of one of those things that how many in here use acquisitions in Evergreen? And it, I don't expect a huge number of hands. So raise them high to make us feel good. Yeah. Okay. Be proud. Proud Fantastic. Act. We uh, have been working with Equinox and King County has done work on this. And Tiffany Little cut her uh, development teeth on this project. Uh, and it is long going. This is actually a project that's been going since I started with the ECDI in 2019, and it's still going, but it's really cool. It is a complete right of the acquisitions um, interfaces and functionality to some extent within Evergreen to make it more user-friendly. The sprint that's going in here, and that's, that's something we need to add is sprint to that thing. So not to this, but to the jargon list. Uh, sprint. Mm. Well, it, we, we use Sprint in a very different way than most people use Sprint, too. I know. I <laughs> sprint is a little selection of development thing that we focus on it, and then we go to the next one and focus on something else. But it's not fast. It's like a Sprint-a-thon. It could be fast. We talk super fast and like a lot of data, detail. You don't know. You do know, actually. <laughs> She's project yeah. manager. She literally gets paid to know. Um, anyway. Uh, so this was a huge uh, bit of development that encompasses purchase orders and uh, selection lists. Purchase orders are really the hub within acquisitions. And so to get this work done, uh, also line items in there is amazing. And if you use acquisitions, I hope it changes your life. If it doesn't, please let us know gently because we're <laughs> very invested in this. <laughs> It's true. So selection lists, uh, I'm going to pass over selection lists. Yeah, a lot of They're Angular, use. yeah, yeah. But this is what they look like in the new interface if you use selection. Loading a dojo purchase order currently is an excruciating uh, process if it's over a certain number of items. Like three. I want you to scream from the rooftops. <laughs> no, not rooftops. Did I say that out loud? Rooftops. You did. Yeah, it was so embarrassing. And recording. Tell people loudly how fast this loads for you. It is amazing and it will actually change your professional life in that very small sphere. <laughs> <Woo -hoo! Yes. laughs> All right. And then of course, line item details. Uh, yes. No, 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 go back one. Go back to line item details. Oh, you have- I want to point out there. Point it out. Um, there is, oh no, it's not on the screen. Go back one more, please. Yeah, so those show, filter, and sort options. Yes, um, yes. So click there to show, filter, and sort options. But we can't because it's a static slide. This would be actually a very cool like presentation to do live, like to demo this feature. Way to bring the demons into the conversation. I still have PTSD from coming to Tiffany me. Little did this. And we did just a tiny, maybe a little bit of cleanup on it. I don't even know. We did very much of it. She did this. And it is a beautiful, beautiful uh, tool uh, that load mark order records. So good. I just am continually impressed and proud of her for doing that. So yeah. 
Okay, I don't want to talk about this one. It's you. Oh, yeah. So this is me. Um, so this is uh, another. <laughs> no, that's not me. This is me. The um, this is uh for people who use EDI um for with your acquisitions orders. Um, thanks to King County and Bill Erickson, there is now a way to uh, communicate additional information with your vendor. So you make an order, your vendor sends you a box, or in case you this case, probably a few pallets of um, materials, and they could be from various different purchase orders and across you know different different groupings of that. So what this allows you to do via EDI is your vendor to communicate to your library, hey, this is this pallet gets like one big barcode, and we're telling you that that at all of the things associated with that master barcode um, are, are in this shipment. Right. So, or if it's just one box, it's a, it's a box barcode. So your vendor communicates to you, this is that label that we're putting on that. You get it, you scan it, and uh, Evergreen knows which uh, line items across various purchase orders are in that order and can receive them um, and batch mark them all as received. Next slide. I was gonna yeah, say. No. I know that doesn't seem like a big thing, but if you're a volume purchaser, yeah, yeah. that's amazing. Which KCLS is, which is what- Oh, there's an interface view. Yeah. Yes, uh, thanks to Bill for, for giving me the screenshot literally yesterday. This is, um, this is super cool. No, 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 go back. I wanted people to revel in that. There is your batch shipping, there is your batch receiving interface. So this is where it's the container barcode is like that grouped barcode and you would scan it and you know receive the various items attached to it. And it'll tell you, you know, based on your uh, line item, like if you have some that are still outstanding, like you can see on the screen that it's received all of them. So if you have that deselected, mm -hmm. um, is it just gonna show you the cont the contents mm -hmm. in that? And then would you scan it again if you decided, yeah, that's cool, I'm ready for it to receive on Correct, the there's also, okay. I did not show this in the, uh, another screenshot, there's also a dry run option. Rock on, okay, yeah. cool. Rock like on it. indeed. Open Athens, and did I say that I was going to talk about this? This literally says Ruth or Andrea. Oh, good. That's good. Okay. Um, go for it. Sure. Okay. Um, so Open Athens is another um, single sign-on uh, option for Evergreen to integrate with, with your Evergreen system. This was um, used. This is used in Georgia uh, with Pines to integrate with their statewide system, Galileo. Um, and there is a new local admin interface to do all your Open Athens sign-on to configure this for your Evergreen system. You do need um, an SSO account with Open Athens, but the Open Athens team did this development work. Um, they wrote some very nice documentation about it, mm -hmm. and um, they're uh, you know feel free to contact them if you want to set this up. But it's an, just another single sign-on option um, that's available for. for and everybody. it's difficult for me to talk about it because I'm just thinking about implementation of it, thinking yeah. how we might do that in. Indiana. It doesn't have pretty pictures. I'm sorry. No, it doesn't. But it's cool yeah. anyway. So we have some some admin ports here. Um, I have my favorite, which is not cash reports, but they they are direct ports from Angular JS or I, this was actually Dojo. I think that was Dojo. Yeah, that was Dojo. No longer, no it's, longer Dojo. It's real ugly right now in three point nine. If you're in three point nine, but no longer. So doesn't have different functionality other than you'll see what normally it was one page before. Um, with the desk payments and then staff user payments now is split into that tabbed interface, which is nice and a little bit more useful because you can also download the CSV for, if you need to for some reason separately. But the library settings editor, this, I will say this is an interim phase because there is a conversation about categorization and things like that. But just making, just porting this to Angular and having filters in place other than just the filter up at the top, having the Angular menus and the edit is so easy to get to. I'm in love with it. How many of you have screwed up filtering the Dojo library settings editor and looked at a blank screen because it was too slow and your typing was too fast or whatever? Yeah, no more. Exactly. Yesterday. Yesterday. <laughs> All right, and, I, and then I went into test server, and I was like, yeah, "Oh, thank oh, you." Oh, so and we should have said this in the beginning, but we are obviously not covering everything with either of these two releases. This is not exhaustive. This is just we're trying to hit the high. Can I make a comment about three ten? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of boring. Um, it's kind of a boring release. A lot of back end work. Um, acquisitions is not the sexiest feature in the entire planet. I'm sorry. How can you say it's not boring? We just had like ten slides about it. We can make anything entertaining. That's true. But nonetheless. Um, but the things that are coming, but we wanted to share those with you because they are a lot of work mm -hmm. and we are very proud of that back end work because it's 
sets the stage for the work that comes down the road and is very important. So now we're talking 311's about- 311's the flashy sister. 311, yeah. And it, it hasn't dropped yet. We're talking in May. So some of this is- it. May is next week. I know. <laughs> She's a buzzkill at times. She's never a buzzkill, that was a lie. Uh, but there is going to be a call. All some of these things we know for sure are going to be in 311 and some of the things we don't know. So we're going to talk about both. Um, this did, I put, one, did I put your name on it? You this did one? put my name on oh. it. Um, so this is one um, that we did for CW Mars. And this is another one of those things that restores a, a lost beloved uh, functionality. What makes it better? What, what, what makes, makes it, it better? better? Because it's yeah. an angular. Um, yeah. So this takes in the in the staff catalog, uh, which has been running Angular interfaces for a few versions now, three six maybe, um, now has a a staff view that is native to there, so you no longer have to. I mean, the patron view button is still there; that'll take you out to the OPAC. But this, but there's broken um, links and embeds like that, yeah. this uh, staff view into the Angular catalog. It has the clickable search links on it. You can uh, harangue your local system administrator to customize this via display fields. Um, and it does uh, honor, even though it's, oh, you will see this on the screenshot. It is the farthest um, left tab, but it is still not, the item table is still the default tab, um, but this will honor the existing library setting or workstation setting, excuse me, to set this as your default tab if you want to um, set this as your default tab. So um, you can see here that this is, um, it's the Angular uh, link formatting is a little hard to see that it is, um, the contrast is terrible. <laughs> Stephanie's like looking right now. <laughs> the contrast is terrible, but title, series title, author, um, subject, as well as those formats and editions, those are all hyperlinked. So you click those and it executes a search. Formats and editions is of course based on meta record groupings. So this is a test system. So it's very small. And I think I actually had to go fake up some data to make you the meta record. You just thing. ignore lady looks for French literature and I general OPAC. Does, don't, don't. <laughs> obviously um Duh. anyway so this now gives that back to the staff um so they now have that there in inside inside the catalog no more going outside the catalog to see this kind of snapshot of it and, and one of the cool things too is that we had the summary um the bib record summary and we went to the staff catalog there was a summary but it was it was missing some things and this returns those but then also adds to them because you had more space in this tab we could actually add I didn't do any of this. Why am I saying we? They could add more things in there that are useful to catalogers, yes. reference staff, et cetera. And that's where the display fields piece come in, comes in. You can, mm -hmm. um, via display fields, you can, you can configure locally what is showing up here. Um, and we're doing further work with Noble um, to do an added content tab so that um, just for novelists right now, but there will be a added content tab that will take novelist content. Content and also be in this tab ribbon. Thanks, Noble. We're going to 100% use that. Okay. All right. So this is actually something that came out of Evergreen, Indiana, and I want to hug it every time I see it. It is something to um, alleviate the issue with giving the update copy permission to people who haven't been trained um, in copy cataloging, but need to replace barcodes or some different things. Um, with copies, but you, in order to do that before you had to grant them update copy, which gave them the permission to do lots of things that Too they could much break, power. and it was bad. Too much power. So we, we worked with Equinox to essentially create a new permission. Uh, the, this update copy barcode, it's, it's humble and amazing, and is going to make workflows in our consortium just a little bit less tense in some cases. So I, should I read the slide? No, because there's okay. a typo in it. Oh, good. Do you, have, do you want me to read the slide? I'm <laughs> just kidding. Okay. We will share the slides so you can read these all later and all of the hyperlinks and everything will all be available. It's also worth noting that we have been switching slides out in real time during the conference because things have been committed. This um, is true. And so I actually moved one and I didn't tell you about it. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, I was going to, but I forgot. Wait, Galen, have there been any more commits? Yes. Tonight since he talked to me. I didn't tell her. Okay, great. <laughs> We're doing it live. Said, yeah, yeah. So this, this is a very dynamic presentation. This okay. went in at 730 this morning. 
Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. This is kind of one of those pieces too that may not be meaningful for you, but it is something that is foundational for forward progress. Yeah. Progress in both the OPAC and the uh, staff client. Yeah. And if I definitely recommend, wait, wait, wait. I definitely recommend that you look at those uh, links at the bottom from Stephanie um, about how like these frameworks support Evergreen mm -hmm. because I have worked with Evergreen for literally, I don't know, 16 or 17 years now. And I, her graphics that she put about explaining how these frameworks work are the clearest and most concise and end user friendly way that I've ever seen anybody explain it. No offense to all the brilliant technical minds in my, in this audience and in my life. Um, so if you want to understand the inter in intersection of frameworks and Evergreen, go look, click those links and look at those two slides. Also, this is the, the, the presentation where we tell everybody who, who we love. So Tiffany and Stephanie so far, not that we don't love the rest of you, but you'll see here their names so many times and wonder why. And there's no good reason other than right. awesomeness. Okay. So this is the one with the asterisk on it that was not in the slide deck. This was asterisk? not here in this position the last time I looked at the slides this morning. Yeah. So right. this is another thing that came out of work with ECDI and Equinox. Uh, ECDI, I'm going to say, is a group of library consortium and library. So it's CW Mars, it is Noble, it is Pines. I'm going through this and I'm gonna let's not say something and I'm gonna feel terrible. Evergreen, Indiana, Lake Agassiz, uh, BC Co-op, shout out if I have missed one because I'm going down the list and I know that, the, wait, was it? Pales. Pales, duh. And Pines, of course, yeah. So all of them coming together and saying, this is important, uh, putting testing resources behind this, looking at specifications. Mike Rylander is, has been not the only one working on it, but this is kind of his passion project uh, for suggestions in the OPAC in the staff catalog. This is the third sprint. Iteration piece? No, third sprint. Do it's the third sprint? step. I don't know, but I'm calling it a sprint just for like continuity of term out terminology. We really need some authority control between me and Ruth in so many ways. Yeah, style guide for how we talk about things. It started out, well, it doesn't, doesn't matter. We're at multi-word single class suggestion yeah. and it is going to be in 311 and it works and it is amazing. And the indexing issues that we saw in the first ones have been addressed. Mm -hmm. Galen might be merging it literally right now as we are talking about this. Everybody, slide. Galen. <laughs> Other people we love. And I will say also this, the stuff that happens like in Amazon and Google, when you get those suggestions and things, it started out a long time ago with a lot more people and a lot more money. And that is what we are building. Yeah. And it is, it's amazing. And you get to be around the people who are actually constructing that thing that no library could afford that. Um, on a comparable shoestring. On their, on, yes. <laughs> if any of you come. Yes. to me and tell me that you want um evergreen search to work like google i'll be like great if you staff me look like google i will make that happen give me the monies and give me the people but this is is an it's impressive amazing. body of work for oh we have screenshots too oh yeah oh, yeah. yeah you talk about the screenshots because i want to like look like sure this. sure sure, like sure. so this is um giving i can't really sorry middle age and my glass oh maybe we both had me too we're both kind of old yeah mm -hmm. <clears throat> true <laughs> <laughs> I'm older. That's true. So this gives a couple of examples. So multi-word single class means um, multiple words and or a phrase within a single search class. So my, my first example here, and I guess I, I should turn this way so I don't turn my head away from my microphone. Um, so the first example is series and I, I did a phrase search. So that's a quote, a quote search, pet the cat. And it's like, nope, no, there is no uh, data for that, but did you mean Pete the cat? And what it's doing is it's looking for actual bibliographic records. Well, it's looking at an index. These are all going to be bibliographic generated search suggestions. So you click Pete the cat and you will get, you know, in this test is like eight or nine results for a series, a series phrase of Pete the cat. Um, and I picked Pete the cat because it's my nephew's favorite. Uh, and Pete's delightful. So this, the second one is a little bit of a contrived example, I realized, but it was in a test system without a lot of authority data. So this one um, is referencing authority data to uh, make your suggestion, in this case, 4XX. Um, although I think a late breaking patch to this has rendered that a lie and that also includes 5XX cross-references. 
correct. Thank you. Oh, Philip. wow. Um, see, this is Whoa. like, you know, I, I'm the kind of person that always does slides like way ahead of time, but this one has been changing literally yeah. up until right now while we're talking about talking to you. And that's both freaking me out a little bit, but also is like such an amazing example <laughs> of this community and what happens when you get all these people together. So um, the second example of frozen stars is referring to the uh, authorized heading of black holes astronomy. And again, I realize it's a little bit of a contrived example, but it's what we have. There's another example slide. Um, this is from looking at the OPAC. So that was looking at the SAPCAR, this is looking at the OPAC. So this one, a uh, common spelling mistake, cemetery, and it gives you a few suggestions there that will generate uh, search results. As you can see from, it corrected the spelling of the second word, but the first word, it gives you a few different suggestions. That's based on, uh, on word stemming, which is something that Evergreen does today, but it's taking that root and it's giving you national and nation and nation apostrophe S. And then the second example is again, a common misspelling of Barbara Streisand and it corrects it to, to Barbara. And that is um, likely based on pro keyboard proximity. Um, but anyway, another common misspelling that is now, that is now redirected. Um, so we are very excited about this. And here we come to the place where you get to do work. This is the audience participation this is you. part of the presentation. <laughs> okay, so this, I love everything about this. So how many in here you use parts in your, in your library? Where is, is Kathy here? Is Kathy? She's probably watching and incrementing parts as karma. On Kathy's behalf, I'm going to say, I love parts. On Ruth's behalf, I'm going to say, I love parts. I hate parts administration, though, among staff because it gets a little crazy. So one of the things that has been an issue for Evergreen Indiana is that uh, we have on order records and or we have new records and uh, people will put a title hold on it. And then at some point, a cataloger or somebody will go in and apply parts to that. And then those holds become hopeless. And if somebody is not checking their hopeless holds, which is an amazing interface, by the way, uh, they will not change this. And sometimes it doesn't even show up on that for some weird little niche issues. Uh, and so we needed to fix it because our libraries were getting a little bit spicy with each other. And we were getting a little bit spicy in our responses and we need to stop it and be nice. So we allowed the software to mitigate this for us. There are two things that were created for this. One was a global flag, which allows you to make a change at a very broad level for an entire consortium. Uh, and then there's also a library setting. And this is for to um, allow for different organizations to choose differently how they apply this. But what it does is that um, for those issues where if it's like an on order record and then they're applied later, that that's, that, well, I'm going to go back here. It doesn't resolve the hopeless holds thing. But what it does do is if you have libraries that have not applied parts to a record where some other library has applied parts, it prohibits a a title level hold being placed on that record. So there's that. If you want to cheer, you can. You don't have to cheer. Don't we have a quote from Britta saying how beautiful it is? Yes, we have a magical. Magical, magical. yes. It also is. didn't make it into the slide, but I did tell the developer who did the work that you thought it was. And I, if I feel like, if it feels like I'm hedging on this at all, I don't know if it would, but there is still going to be policy that has to go in with this. And that's where I'm thinking, oh, dear God, we're going to talk about policy, um, which is <laughs> my job. Sorry. Sorry, everybody that's watching saying, why is she cringing at policy? But anyway, moving on. <laughs> this other thing here um, has also been a pain point for Evergreen Indiana in the whole screen. If there are parts applied to a record and say that there is also um, and a holding that does not have parts applied to it, it would traditionally go into that bucket of things called all parts, which does not describe what you're getting if you place a hold on that. It's probably one holding somewhere that's maybe somebody's checking that shelf. I don't know. And it, it's, it's, we don't know what part it is. It could be number one, number two, whatever. 
So this creates an interface and we have a picture. Okay, I'll go back. Global flag, library setting in the new Angular library settings. It's so beautiful. It creates this interface here where you can actually, or your system administrator can go in and can customize what that label says. That's gonna be another policy thing, or at least a consortial conversation in Evergreen, Indiana, what we want that label to be. I am a fan of don't click here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No touchy, <laughs> you don't like it. Abandon all hope. You yeah, yeah. It. But then we don't want it to abandon all hope because it won't scroll down to the parts. Whatever. Just kidding. Um, anyway. So anyway, you can do that. There is another thing in here that I didn't actually mention. There was, as part of this development, another interface that was created to um, customize some other strings. It, they have to do with internationalization uh, interface that currently only does the parts, but in future development can yeah. be uh, added to so that translation strings can be done by end users via the interface um, as soon as they are added. Right now it only has one, but it can have many, many more. A cool thing about these this feature is it builds infrastructure for stuff later yep. on as well and addresses a parts issue. And if there are other parts issues you want addressed, I will talk to you in six months about them. Mm -hmm. Cute and just. just. All right. Any late breaking updates on this one, Galen? All right. Cute and just. We'll so almost for the be people in place by Saturday, yes. you heard it here first. Go ahead. And I totally I'll talked over you. Say it again. No, for this Zoom. is the one I said. Cute and just will likely be in place. It merged for 311 by Saturday. So you heard it here first. This is the the nerdy one that I am really excited about. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have, oh, do I have any pretty pictures? No, it's, it's background work. This is this is infrastructure, but this is sexy infrastructure. This makes a lot of things better and this will make your catalogers happy. And we all know that we want to make catalogers mm -hmm. happy, right? Right, I'm looking specifically at the it catalogers. Means move on and um, work on other stuff while things are happening. It's much more efficient. Right, processing. so this has a lot of fancy words here about parallelization and processing queues and whatever. But what you need to know is that it um, makes bib updates and authority propagation faster. It resolves a very long standing bug about authority merge timeouts. And um, especially for large data sets, we are really excited that this is going to be a game changer in, in a good way, so. Um, yay, cute and just um, and, and hold wait, on. Hold on. Okay, so yeah, you say your thing, and I, then I want to ask the, the I also just want to another shout out for for doing things live and in person because yesterday at Hackfest, um, at, at the nudging of Jennifer Weston, head mm -hmm. of the cataloging interest group, um, some of the best and brightest minds. Oh, it's okay. Sorry, it's in, in the evergreen development community, we're working together on fixing the last struggling issues of this and getting it over the hump. So, yay, yay. and also. A shout out to uh, both uh, the developers Hackfest and the Dig Hackfest, which happened in the same space, separate but equal. That's terrible. Anyway, what it actually was, was everybody being in a room and talking about this is what we need and them saying, I don't know who you are, tell me more. And then, no, that didn't happen. But then saying, oh, we actually looked at this thing and this is what we need to do. And then somebody else saying, I'll look at it with you and then saying, does it work yet? And then continuing to gnaw at that bone and get something in yeah, magic. by Saturday. So that is awesome. There was something else that I was going to say. I'm sorry. It's okay. Jessica. Think about it later. Mm -hmm. Back to it. Doesn't we do matter. have to, um, we got 11 minutes. But we I can think we're do doing it. Good. I think we're doing good. I think we're doing good on time. Um, custom. Yeah, that's panel. right. Oh, my name's on it. I, that's what I just said. <laughs> my name's on it. We can so, only do about half an hour together. That's a lie. No, what? Are, oh my God, no. Someday we're going to like go on around the world vacation together. We will. It's It'll true. be great. Um, so custom penalties, back to the present. Custom penalties. Mm -hmm. um, is it in there? Oh, this was a, a little piece of work that that puts um, a set of new library settings. Youse, uh, yet another org unit setting, library settings. <laughs> um, this lets you set a uh, custom value for some stock penalties and thereby hooking your custom penalty into the stock penalty infrastructure so you can do different things with different penalties at different org units. Um, so this is um, like without any like backend is tweaking. So 
the workflow that I posted there is optionally, you can either create a new penalty or use an existing penalty. Um, you create your penalty thresholds as usual in group penalty threshold. And then using the library settings, next slide, you, um, these library settings, you map that to whatever you want the penalty to be at whatever location. So that is um, a way for you to, to if you want to do different things at different org units. Um, so this was okay. uh, Pales, and they do have uh, libraries that do different things with penalties and penalty thresholds and things like that. So if you do global penalties all across your consortium, you know, this is less helpful to you. But if you do different things with different penalties at different sites, mm -hmm. um, take a look at this. Um, well. It is still pending for 3.11, but when it goes in, um, this is something that could potentially interest you. So if you are somebody that has a multi-type consortium, yes. uh, you, it, you would be the perfect test case to come in and, and check this out. So if you want to test it, you don't know where to find like one of us or a developer you know or whatever, yep. and we'll get you get you in there. I can't do it, but I will to totally drag you. I have everywhere. test notes that I'm happy to share. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she, she knows yep. way more than I do. Okay, it's enhanced concerto data set. This is one that is, we want to get it in real hard. This did come out of ECDI, but it was not the ECDI that worked on it. This was truly a community effort. It started with some meetings and a spreadsheet and a bunch of people coming in. As all testing server. Through. Yeah, yeah. So if you have experience with a stock installation or a test server environment for Evergreen, you get what is called the Concerto data set. It's very small. It came out of the Berkeley School of Music back in the day when Yamil was like giving us nicely. I, I literally did not know that right now. That's amazing. I always wondered why it's such esoteric like music stuff. Yeah, and I love it. Yamil so gave it major, to us. Yeah. It's because Yamil... PIL, yeah. everybody. Thank you, Emil, yeah. for the Concerto data set. Right. I hope he's watching. But it, it isn't it for like library testing to go in there? There's a lot of stuff that has to be done to actually test a real world scenario with that Concerto data set. And so the enhanced Concerto, uh, which keeps all of the bibliographic records, but then adds some more to it, also builds out things like uh, library systems. Um, why did I put that in there? Oh, I know there's another thing in here it, is it actually, this is a terrible interface. This is, so this is also actually the, the, the replacement for this is also on the list for 311. <laughs> it's newly pull requested and ready for additional testing. But what I want to point out is not obvious here, but there are actually stat cats in this so that you can test using those. Without making your own stat cats in the data. I didn't think that. Yeah. Um, and there are circulation modifiers that are in there. Uh, we did not create circ policies based on that, but now you have the raw materials to create those things um, if that uh, is in there. So um, we also have been working with Mobius to create a mechanism for easily applying that uh, to a test environment to build that, build that out without going into like building out your entire thing. So that's what that is. Uh, take a look at it. Hopefully we can get that over the hump in there and in there as well. Uh, it's great for building a training server in your consortium um, yeah. if that's something that you do. Closer to realistic test data. Yeah, with and easier on a system admin for setting it up. Yeah, yeah. and somebody administering testing stuff. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Zip the filters. filters. Okay, so this one um, has, you know, languished a little bit for um, community attention. So this is my plea to look at this. And I understand why no one has looked at it because it does intersect with SIP server and the uh, upcoming SIP2 mediator work that Bill Erickson has been working on. And it touches a lot of things, but um, the this is actually a very uh, handy little tool, which lets you, well, you the evergreen administrator, mm -hmm. um, selectively either redact or overwrite uh, portions of SIP messages that your system may be sending out to a third party. So um, if your third party service, you know, wants email addresses, because that is how it's, and you don't want to send your email addresses, you can redact that, or you can overwrite patron names, or you can anonymize other data, as long as it's not obviously, if the SIP2 associated uh, vendor needs that data to function, you know, don't foot gun yourself. 
but uh, it does give uh, administrators another privacy tool to make sure that you're only sending the data that you need to be sending and that you can redact or overwrite it as, as needed. So that is what, this is a um, pending SIP2 mediator. There is even a handy, uh, lovely uh, interface for this uh, regular SIP2. This is a, a, a backend config and an oil file, I believe. This is pretty cool. This is have yeah, an so, administrative interface for this. Yeah. I just but that I mean, intersect so that there's like there's like a triangle of things with this. Yeah. So pick a pick a corner of the triangle and, and help. Um oh wait, no. Well, I don't know. Oh, I didn't know about this. I so these are examples that I did. Um and this is you just kind of create a little a little filter. So I have the top example is um an overwrite. So I say for AE, which is the the patron name filter, you know, I want to overwrite it to be Andrea fake patron so nobody knows who I am. That's my secret identity. Um and then for the uh B E field, which is um email somebody correct me if i'm wrong i made this slide a long time ago pretty sure be is email um and i'm instructing it to strip that field so it will just send um and, and it will send no data in that field um and you do that via via the interface and then do we have a dictionary for the sub filters by chance a dictionary yeah yeah that says what the what? The actual field identifiers correlate to you just said is it? Oh, we don't. Um, okay. I, I had to dig the depths of the internet to find it, but that would be a good documentation project. Okay. Um, with all that time that Dig has, so or whoever anybody can participate in documentation and submit it. To That's it. true. Anybody can participate. Doc Yesterday, Britta emailed um, a documentation file or posted it on Launchpad and live uh dig we converted it to ascii doc and pushed it all the way back to three six and that was just you know that was a, a file that she had typed up in word so that it works with me. docs to us in any format we will take them we will chew them up and spit out ascii doc next slide it's Britta's first conference and her first commit i don't have a commit and i've been with evergreen for years so she's awesome she's right there <laughs> she doesn't like me. She doesn't like me giving her accolades, but I can't stop. So speaking of community, observe the importance of this bright orange slide, and not just because I'm a Baltimore Orioles fan. Um, <laughs> that stuff that we just talked about in the preceding section um, that is still pending for 311. Um, so the current community release schedule is looking at May 1st, which you is mean next Monday? Week. Is it Monday? Yeah, it's Monday. Monday. This Monday, Monday May 1st Monday. is the cutoff Monday. for 311. <laughs> And if you liked the features that we talked about in that third section, if you know a developer, if you can wrangle a committer, um, these if you are an end user who can test, um, these are all things still waiting. And if you are an end user who can test, the next slide um, has a list of things that you can still test. Now, because I didn't, because I foolishly edited this slide at nine in the morning and not like an hour ago, um, I can now say, did you mean should not no longer be on this list? It is on the test server, but it is no longer in need of testing. Um, but you can play with it. You can play with it. And then on um, Equinox, there is a very small Angular interface uh, cleanup. And then two, count them, two servius, servers from Mobius with some various other uh, things on them in need of testing. Um, so like monograph parts, uh, the part stuff that Ruth was talking about, the concerto data set, um, SIP filters, SIP2 mediator, which is related to SIP filters, but we didn't go into a couple of other um, admin ports, uh, like the CERC policy port, which we also didn't talk about, but is also out there. Please, 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 um, if you can find time at this conference or this weekend, because everyone likes to test software on the weekends, right? And, and I wanted to go back here real quick. On this page, the public test servers, that does list Mobius's, at least mm -hmm. one of Mobius's bug squash um, yeah. servers. Uh, it does not list butternut, uh, which belongs which is a to squash. Jason Boyer, by it's the way. It's a squash. Get it? squash. Nah, nah, nah. Oh, that's what the patty pan is. Oh, my gosh. We are like, we're like, just right this exact second. So okay. We're all learning today. We're all learning. Today. Dang, Jason Boyer. I know. Is he here? We love No, no, here. he wouldn't be in here. He's all right. doing the development. So these are, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyway, that that's, that's yeah. They're all used concerto. Um, for logins and admin demo one, two, three, and the, some emails, community emails went out um, about that earlier this week. So we are at 12 so quickly. I mean, yeah. is at the heart of that. Yeah. Yeah. Conference there. agrees. Sponsoring organizations. Yay! <laughs> These are um, the organizations that sponsored all of the development we talked about in preceding slides. Again, this is not everyone who sponsored everything. This is just people who sponsored what we talked about 
three tiers to these people, eight developers representing five organizations did that code um, that we talked about. Yay. Um, these are some links for you and uh, credits. Uh, and then that is it. Oh, wait, one more slide. Okay. I didn't actually have time to think about a bad joke this year. Um, so I'm sorry to let you down, but I did tell you I was a Baltimore Orioles fan. So if there's any bad joke in the AL East, it's the Boston Red Sox. Oh. All right. Thank you. We are at time. Um, if you have any questions, grab us. We're here. Thank okay, you. Thank Don't forget to everybody. We're here all week. Woohoo. All right.